Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Annotation Station. I'm your host, Stephanie Spars, and we're going to kick today's session off with a nice little joke to liven things up. Why didn't the sailors play cards? Because the captain was standing on the deck. Okay, but in all honesty, the text that we're going to be taking a closer look at today is Herman Melville's Benito Serino. Now, many of you might know Herman Melville as the author of Moby Dick, um, and Benito Serino is another text that takes place in the middle of the ocean on a boat, um, and we're going to go ahead and take a look at a passage from this today while we annotate. So in the interest of time, we're going to pretend that we have already done our initial first reading. Now when you're doing your annotation, a first reading is a way to acquaint yourself with the text and to get a great understanding for what it is actually saying. Um, so you can then later delve into some of the more nuanced approaches to looking at this literature. We're at the point in this novel where we encounter Captain Delano on his boat, our protagonist here, uh, who is looking at a strange ship far away in the distance. And the strange thing about this ship is that it's not actually flying colors, which means that there's no flags to indicate where the boat has come from or what its purpose for being on the sea is. So Delano is obviously in a state of uncertainty and trying to figure out what to do. This in turn prompts him to lower a nice little whaling boat to go out and see what is going on with this ship. And this is where we're gonna pick off with our paragraph starting right here uh, at the top of the page. I've gone ahead and I've labeled my paragraphs to make it a little bit easier for us to talk about this. We're gonna begin up here. Surmising at last that it might be a ship in distress, Captain Delano ordered his whaleboat to be dropped and much to the wary opposition of his mate, prepared to board her and at the least pilot her in. So we're gonna stop there because I've underlined a couple key words. Uh, we've got surmising, it might, and wary opposition. Now these things we're going to notice because they tell us actually a lot about Captain Delano, right? So what is the choice that Melville is making when he's putting all of these questioning words in? It might, wary opposition, indicate to us that nothing is really quite certain. Uh, surmising again, we're looking at guesswork here. So it's clear to us from the choices that Melville is making that Captain Delano is very uncertain about going out to the ship and finding out what's going on. Great, so we're gonna continue on with our third paragraph and take a look at some other ways that we can close read this text. We're gonna look specifically at color with this paragraph. You can note that I've outlined all of our color references here uh, with these nice little boxes. So this is interesting because that's a lot of color references to stick in just this one tiny paragraph. Let's take a closer look at this first reference here. Upon gaining a less remote view, the ship, when made signally visible on the verge of the leaden-hued swells, uh, with the shreds of fog here and there raggedly furring her, appeared like a whitewashed monastery after a thunderstorm, seen perched upon some dun cliff among the Pyrenees. Okay, so we've got a couple things to look at here. One, I have no idea what dun is, so let's go ahead and look it up. We've got our handy dictionary definition that dun uh, means a dull or grayish brown. Okay, so definitely a color reference there. Leaden-hued swells. So lead, just like your pencil lead, indicates gray, which is neither black nor is it white. It's somewhere in the middle. We can also think of the sea as a transient space here, um, as somewhere where things can happen and it's very uncertain. So lead indicates that he's sort of trapped out on sea here um, in a very uncertain way. So lead, our color, actually signifies some really important commentary that Melville is making um, about the conditions out at sea. Whitewash, so white is usually meant to indicate something that's pure um, or clean, something like that. It's it's very a noble color, as it were. Uh, monastery has religious connotations for us. So a monastery is a space where monks live to meditate and contemplate. Uh, so whitewashed, we're talking about the boat. Uh, it's standing out against the contrast of this leaden hued swell. So it's very bright, very easy for us to see. So we're going to continue on with done here. Done again is another one of those in-between colors, kind of like our gray, our lead color up here. Um, so to put uh, that contrast in here again indicates a sense of transience. Melville is really kind of emphasizing that nature here is kind of uncertain. So we'll skip now down to dark. We've got two different references to dark. Uh, so we've got our dark cowls and dark figures moving around on the ship. 
Now imagine that you're Captain Delano and you're looking out at this boat. Uh, it's white and it seems to be optimistic and beautiful and holds something there um, that is positive, but you see these dark shadowy figures moving on deck. What kind of tone does that indicate to our readers that there's been a shift in? Delano is looking at this. He sees some dark shadowy figures uh, that again brings about our uncertainty that relates to our analysis of our character in our very first paragraph. Now using dark or blackness as a term of uncertainty, danger, uh, does have its own connotation. So that's something that we're actually going to take a look at when we get down to our fourth paragraph here. All right, so another fun way that we can continue our close reading analysis uh, is by doing some work with a critical lens. Now a critical lens is simply another way to view things through a specific viewpoint. This can help us understand a text more deeply or understand another interpretation. So I've written post-colonial and eco-critical as two examples of lenses that we can look at that are specific to what we might find in our text here that we've already explored a little bit. So let's continue our reading. Upon a still nigher approach, this appearance was modified and the true character of the vessel was plain. A Spanish merchantman of the first class carrying Negro slaves amongst other valuable freight from one colonial port to another. Wow, great sentence to look at through a post-colonial lens. So when we mean post-colonial, we're talking about the interactions of race and colony and how those pertain to our text. So obviously we've got a lot of fraught language here with Negro slaves as being valuable freight, not actually people. We've got a reference to a colonial port, meaning one colony has gone to another space and taken it over as their own. And we've got a Spanish merchantman. So we understand these things as being important because Spanish merchantmen took over a port, they've made a colonial port, and are carting around slaves that are viewed as property or freight on their ship. So what does this text tell us about those things? Well, one, it was clearly written in a time where this sort of thing was normal, but we've also still got the character of the vessel was plain. This seems to reveal something to Captain Delano. So he's almost relieved to see that it's a Spanish merchantman with a bunch of Negro slaves on his boat. Much better. Now he understands what's going on here. Um, so viewing things through this post-colonial lens can really help us understand the role that the people on the ship played, specifically in, in relation to race, right? Um, so there are a lot of implications to looking at things in this way. I'd also like to take a brief moment to acknowledge an eco-critical lens. So this is looking at the role that the environment plays, and we've obviously covered this a little bit earlier when we were looking at our colors swells, okay, our Duncliff. So these kinds of words and word choices here are really sort of indicating the uncertainty of nature. We've also got things like shreds of fog. We talk about a hazy distance. Um, all of these things kind of point to nature as being this wild and unpredictable space that humans should be very wary of. So acknowledging something through an eco-critical lens here, we can see that nature is uncertain. Nature has the potential to be dangerous. What kind of things does that set up for our readers at home? Now, during Melville's time, lots of people will do what's called armchair adventures or armchair travel. And while they'd never actually been to sea, they could read Melville's texts or other writers similar um, and get the feeling of adventure and sense that they had actually been out on the seas. So if the work that people are reading is telling them that nature is dangerous, what kind of implications does that have um, for people who'd never really experienced it before? So looking at things through an eco-critical lens can actually be a really fun way um, to ask some questions about your text and to view it in a way and see how the interpretations of this text can really differ um, depending on how you're looking at it. Okay, so let's tie all of our threads together from doing this close reading. We've got a very uncertain captain, as noted by some of the word choices that Melville makes up here, surrounded by a very uncertain environment, kind of indicated here through our eco-critical reading um, by using our colors and the references that Melville makes to nature. Um, and we've also got a little bit of a, a post-colonialist narrative going on in terms of looking and navigating the tension between the Negro slaves and a Spanish merchantman. Now notice here that Spanish does not indicate white. Uh, so there is some sort of in-between that a Spaniard wouldn't necessarily be a Negro slave, so he's not quite property, but he isn't quite white like Captain Delano is. 
So looking at all of these things from our close reading, we've got a very uncertain picture uh, framing the setup for the rest of our novel. And doing close readings like this is a really great way to start to ask yourself some questions about what's going to come next. So we want to know what kind of interactions Captain Delano will have among other things. We've picked up threads on color and nature, and these we can track through the rest of the text if we so desire, um, and continue to do some close reading analysis with the rest of these themes in mind. So thank you so much for spending this time with me. I hope you've gotten a little bit out of doing our close reading together, and I look forward to seeing you on our next episode. Thanks, and have a great night.